Good morning, everyone. Beautiful day. It's uh, Mother's Day as well, a day that we commemorate uh, moms. Um, I think of my mom who is with the Lord at this point, but uh, neat that I know that. I have that assurance that I will see her one day. And um, we just want to uh, worship this morning and look to our Lord and our Savior. And uh, this first song, um, as you know, that uh, Pastor Dave last week was preaching on grace, and this week a little bit more of that. What great subject, the grace of God. And uh, the first song we're going to sing is, I Know Whom I Have Believed. And a um, song writ written actually by Daniel Webster Whittle. And um, just read the first verse of that just for you real, real quick. It says, I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. Two key words in there. One is wondrous grace, which is two words, but grace, and then redeemed. And uh, those two words are, are obviously words that um, are important to our salvation. You know, if it, whenever we're here in grace, you think of that known definition of unmerited favor. If you ever want to do a kind of an acrostic of, of grace, you know, G-R-A-C-E, you can remember that this, God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. And uh, it's a great definition. Just one more thing. This song actually comes from 2 Timothy 1.12. It's a quotation, For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Let's stand and let's sing. Right from Scripture, let's sing that song.
Grace greater than our sin. say my sin on those course but it's all of our sin well good morning happy Mother's Day to all of you mothers and uh, I appreciate my mother she's in heaven and uh, can't wait to uh, rejoin her go through her recipe box now that I'm doing more cooking uh, I need some help so but uh, it is always good to remember what mothers have done, and I encourage you to honor them today. Well, this morning's message is not a Mother's Day message, but it is, uh, as James pointed out, we talked about grace last week, and I couldn't get enough of it. So I decided one more week of grace couldn't be overdone. I, I just don't know how you can overdo grace. And so uh, the title of the message is Abundant Grace. And we are going back really to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, which is the proto-evangel, which means the proto uh, 
telling of the good news, the gospel, in, in very seed kind of form. But it is filled with grace. And it shows that when, when man sinned, God should have wiped out everything. He, I mean, he put man in a perfect environment. He put, he put the two best looking people ever together. All of these kind of things and, and provided for them with everything. And yet they sinned against him. But right after it says that the, the, the serpent will... Uh, bite at the heel of this one who is going to come, this seed of the woman, the Savior, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and he will crush the head of Satan. And then right after that, instead of, of condemning and, and judging Adam and Eve and, and putting them to death, which they deserved, he showed grace. He did curse the ground. He did cause uh, more pain in childbirth. He, those are the kind of things that they, they did deserve, but they, they actually deserved to die. And yet in his grace, he didn't do that. And James mentioned that, uh, the definition of grace, but it is truly unmerited favor. It is something you do not deserve. It is God's provision for the undeserving. And that's what we want to talk about this morning, is things that maybe we haven't thought about as far as God's abundant grace to us. Because when you look at it, if you look at it carefully, everything that God does is gracious. Yeah. Yeah. There is nothing that he does that is not gracious to us. Why? Because none of us deserve anything. That is our problem. Many times I think I deserve to be treated differently because I'm a real asset to the kingdom of God. And for those of you at home, everybody agreed here. No? Okay. <laughs> but don't, don't we get that kind of, why, why does this happen to me? You hear people all, uh, on the news, you know, why did God let this happen? Why did this disaster happen? What, it's like we deserve something. But after sinning in the garden, Adam and Eve didn't deserve anything, and we're in Adam and Eve. We do not deserve anything, and God is gracious to give us anything. Oh, there were three of them. All right, three amens. <laughs> but when we look at the fullness of God's grace, we see it better than Adam and Eve because we see God's grace against the backdrop of sin. We, we see an, a, a holy God offended, sinned against, and yet he continues to show us sin, uh, grace. He graciously dealt with Adam and Eve. He gave the promise of a deliverer. Reading through the Old Testament right now, did God, has God shown grace to the nation of Israel? Oh my gosh, and they deserved every bit of it. What did they deserve? They deserved to be punished. They deserved to have the covenant revoked. They deserved all of that, but God didn't do it. He dealt with Israel with grace. And finally, he deals with everyone through the cross, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ dying on the cross for us. In your notes, I put a quote by uh, James Montgomery Boyce. It says, grace, God has provided for us in every possible way, both physically and spiritually, in spite of the condemnation we deserve. Isn't that amazing? I'm more vindictive than that. Nobody's noticed, but how, this is not right, folks. <laughs> Treat your pastor like this. 
We deserve condemnation, but Jesus continues to show us grace. And not only grace, but abundant grace. We gain as believers more through the work of Christ than we lost in what Adam did. Romans chapter 5 and verse 20 and 21 says, The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. That, that just means that so you would know when you're doing wrong, okay? So, and that's what the Ten Commandments do and other laws. But, but where sin increased, listen to this, where sin increased, grace increased all the more. That is so powerful, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Where sin started to pile up, what piled up higher? Grace. Paul goes on to say, should we keep on sinning in chapter 6, so that grace, well, we can show just how good God God is through his grace. He says, oh no, don't do that. And we don't have time to go there. But grace is always greater than our sin. What did we just sing? Marvelous grace. Infinite grace. Greater than our sin. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Grace untold points to the refuge, the mighty cross. It's freely bestowed on all who believe. We are graced. And one of the reasons I wanted to focus on grace again this week is because we face a very tough and difficult world. Probably it's ne never been worse than this. All of the predictions of the prophets and everything are pointing to the soon return of Jesus Christ. And I know prophetic speakers have been saying that since the 1950s, and I, and I believe it. But with God, you know, a hundred years, but it is, you can see the flow. The things we would have thought, uh, thought of as unimaginable even 10 or 20 years ago are now blatant and flagrant out in front of us. I saw a, a headline in the, in the Times with our Supreme Court going to shoot down the Roe versus Wade and praise the Lord that they finally are doing that and recognizing the right to life. Now, I don't know all their reasons, but I'm glad that they're doing it. But it showed our governor and a bunch of people around him with his hand up in the air like this and says, we are going to fight like hell to overturn that. And I thought, how appropriate. How appropriate to use the word hell. Where does that come from? It comes from the pit of hell. It comes from Satan and all that he stands for. And we're facing this kind of thing today. And you stand up for Jesus Christ and you are going to be inundated with people saying, yeah, you're not being kind. You're not being accepting. The, fu the fullness of Christ's victory provides us with four undeserved and unimaginable gifts to live powerful and confident lives in this sin-filled world. And that's what we want to talk about this morning. And if you can't tell, I'm excited about it. Okay. Number one, the gift of Christ in you. Oh my. If we, if we forget about grace, and, and grace is a gift it's something given that we don't deserve, but we are to take it and we are to receive it. And, the, and one of the great gifts of grace is Christ in you. So many other religions have to go here and go there to find their God. Where do we go? 
We go inside because that's where God dwells in the person of the Holy Spirit. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27 it says this, to them, or you could say to us, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery. And mystery just means it hasn't been revealed up until this time. Which is Christ in you. You remember in the Old Testament, uh, David, when he went to, out to battle, the, the Lord came upon him, or the Spirit came upon him, or Samson, uh, the power, the Spirit would come upon him and he could do these uh, tremendous things. But in today, when Christ had died on the cross and risen from the grave, he gave us the Holy Spirit, God, and he placed him where? In us. This God who cannot be contained by the universe. He is outside of the universe. He's infinite. And yet he has chosen to live in that universe. And he's made a, a heaven for himself to rule and to reign. And then he, to Israel he said, I will be in your tabernacle between the cherubim. I will be there. I will make my home there. And then after the cross he says, I will make my home, my throne. Where? In your heart. How far is God away from you? He is right there. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 it says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I am amazed by that, that the God of the universe thinks enough of me to live inside of me. And folks, he knows me. So do you, but not like he does. But he chooses to make my heart his home. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 11, and it says, And if the spirit of him, and I, I look at those ifs and I change them to since. Because that's what it means in the Greek. And since the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead. Who's the spirit of him? Spirit of God is the Holy Spirit. And he, he raised him from the dead is living in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will, make, will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Do you think Paul's trying to make a point? Where does he live? And sometimes when we face the trials in life, we say, I don't have the power. And sometimes I don't even have the desire to do it. But the Holy Spirit, his whole job is to give us that power. We do not have our own power to face the world today. We have the power of God living in us. And our problem is we don't let him live it through us. We need to let the Spirit live out His life through us to give us the desire to do that which is right and then the power to actually do it. How many resolutions have you made over the years? And sometimes our resolutions, if it's on our own power, it doesn't, it doesn't last. But the power of the Spirit of God very God is living in this. The gift of Christ in you. What grace that is. And in your notes it says, what, what does this mean? Letter A, it is eternal. When God comes to stay, where does, how long does he stay? Until you mess up? Heavens no. He'd be gone in an instant. He comes and indwells you because you have accepted him as your personal savior and he is there for eternity. And having that in letter B, it always leads to righteousness. How do you know you're saved? How do you know that Christ lives in you? It's by how you act. It's how you live. What direction are you going? What direction is the Holy Spirit going? Towards evil or righteousness? I mean, we know that. There, there's no doubt. The Holy Spirit cannot go to evil. He hates evil. 
And where is he living? He's in us, and he's always prompting us to go towards righteousness and doing the right thing. He strives after it. It is his nature to do that. He hates sin, and he clings to good, and we can tell that Christ lives in us when we move in that same direction at his prompting. And I would ask you, how do you know that you have this new nature in you? How, how do you know? There's been times I wake up in a cold sweat in the middle of the night and say, do I really believe? Is, is Jesus really my Savior? Is he going to take me to heaven? And then I come back to the, the words of Scripture. 1 John chapter 2 says, this is how we know we are in him. Oh, I just asked that question, didn't I? How do we know that Christ is in us? And he says this, whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Well, that's easy. Well, not so easy. But it gives us a direction. It gives us where we should be going. And people should look at our lives and say, oh, that guy is going in the same direction as Jesus. Now, Jesus lived a perfect and sinless life. That is impossible for us. But what direction are you going? Can people see it? Can they tell that Christ is in you? In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 9, it says, No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him or in them, they cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't, as soon as you receive Jesus Christ, you become perfect. That doesn't mean that. To go on sinning means you cannot go on sinning the same sins over and over without reflecting on God judging that that you are in light, that you know that you are doing wrong. And so what does the Bible say when you know you're doing wrong? Confess your sins. Agree with God that you're wrong, that he's right, and turn from it, repent, and go the direction that the Holy Spirit would lead you. Christ in you is a gift from God to help you face life. It is, it gives you courage because it's not easy. First John 4, 4 says, you have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Number two, God gives us the gift of justification. Christ in you, that's where he lives. But the gift of justification. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 16 it says, Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. Who was the one man? It was Adam, right? The judgment that followed one sin brought condemnation to everyone who came after. But, listen to this, the gift the gift followed many trespasses, brought justification. When Jesus died on the cross, he took care of the sins of the entire world. Now, not everybody's going to heaven. I understand that. You still have to claim it. You have to believe in Jesus as your personal Savior, but he died for everyone. Not one was left out. But there will still be some who turn hard hearts toward believing in Jesus. Letter A, Christ paid our debt. How, see, man has this problem. How can he become right with God? God is perfect, is he not? He's holy, totally apart from sin. And here's man over here, he is born a sinner completely separated from God. How can the two ever get together? Can man do it? No. 
Man cannot do it. Man cannot cross the gulf from sin to holiness on his own. Can God come to the man? Absolutely. In Romans chapter 3 and verses 22 through 24 it says, This righteousness is given through faith in Christ Jesus to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That leaves us in a very bad situation. Falling short of the glory of God means that you have not attained perfection. If you want to get into heaven right now without God, all you have to do is be perfect. How you doing? I bet you didn't even make it to church today without something going on. Oh, except for. <laughs> oh, you said amen. Amen. <laughs> Boy, when you got them disagreeing with you in the audience, I mean, you're <laughs> now yeah, he's with me, I know. For all have sinned. How many have sinned? All. all. Does that include you? Okay. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If you're trying to get from where you are, a sinful man, to a holy God, you have fallen short. I've often said it's like trying to cross, jump the... Uh, Grand Canyon, I lost that. I could see the Grand Canyon, I couldn't think of the word. Uh, and, and you're on this side, God's on this side, and you're trying to get over there on your own. The best athlete in the world has jumped close to 30 feet in the long jump. I think it's a little farther. And the worst person in the world, the, the most, one most physically handicapped, in a wheelchair, would try to cross that and get going towards the edge, how far out would he get? Maybe an inch. Maybe some. Where, where would he end up? On the bottom. Where would the best long jumper end up? On the bottom. Who's better off? They are both dead. They're both flat. Because man cannot get to God for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. But, he says, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption with, that came by Jesus Christ. Justification is the work of God to declare us to be righteous when we believe. It, it's a judicial, uh, judicial term. He declares us to be perfect. Now, we know that we still retain sin before we get to heaven, but he sees me right now. He has declared me to be perfect. Why? Because I believed in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 33, it says, Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Now, you don't even need to know what it says after this. But what's the answer to that question? If God has chosen you, who can bring a charge against you? No one. Because God is omnipotent. God is infinite. God is over all. So if God says, I chose you, no one, not even Satan, can come in and say, you are not. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen, it is God who justifies. Who declared you righteous? You? No, it is God who did it. Who then is the one who condemns? And the answer Paul puts in, there is no one. Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. He's saying... Once God declares you righteous, you are righteous in his sight. When he looks down from heaven, he sees you through the blood of Jesus Christ, and you still have that sin nature in you, but he sees you as perfect. He sees you just like his own son, Jesus Christ. 
I've tried to describe this before, but it's, it's like um, in, a, in a ledger. You open, you open a book like this, and there's two columns on each side. And on one side it says Jesus Christ, the other side it says Dave Marks Perry. Maybe it's a few pages over. Uh, but on the ledger, on Jesus' side, and on my side, it says good and bad. Good on one side, bad on the other, good, bad. Now, if you were looking at Jesus' ledger, and you looked at the good side, what would you see? Oh, man. He is, he is good, he's gracious, he's merciful. You, you just go on down the line, and he, it, it just kind of runs on to the next page. What if you look at his bad side? Ze Any sin? None. Zero. I don't want you to get carried away with this side. But on Dave Marksbury's side, on the good side, what would you see? Oh, well, I can take it. <laughs> yeah. I was born a sinner. There is nothing good. Not one thing on my good side. But then you get over to the bad side. And Claudia, you keep quiet. <laughs> what goes on over there? Selfish, pride. You just go on down the line, and it would go off the bottom of the chart. That's the ledger that we're looking at. And the one that is acceptable in heaven is Jesus' side. That is the ledger that God accepts. He accepted Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and seated him at the right hand of God, so he accepts what's on that page. And he accepts anybody else who looks like that page. How are we doing? Not good. So God had to do something about Dave's bad side, his sin side. And you know what he did? He sent his own son to die on a cross, to shed his blood, so that when I believed on that bad side of Dave's ledger, the blood covered it. The blood took all the sin and the guilt away, and that is blank. Whose side does it look like now? It looks like Jesus. Because there's nothing on the bad side of Dave because he believed in Jesus. But do you know that's not enough to get me into heaven? I'm close. That's not enough to get me there. Because what else is on Jesus' ledger? The righteousness of good stuff. All the things that God accepts are on his side, and my side's still blank. And so, letter B, Christ imputed his righteousness to us. He credited his righteousness to us, to me. He took all the good that was on Jesus' side of the ledger, and he moved it over and he put it on mine. Is that grace? Oh, I deserved it. No, I didn't deserve it. None of us deserve it. God moved. He, 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 the shed blood covered, and then he moved or he credited all of Jesus' righteousness to mine. Now what does my page look like? It looks just like Jesus Christ. And when I stand before him, and I, I don't, this won't be how it is, but if he were to say, well, Dave, why should I let you into heaven? I'll say, because your son covered my sins with his blood, and you gave me his righteousness. I stand here in his righteousness and not my own. He says, come on in. That's what he does. In Romans chapter 4 and verses 3 and verse 5, we're talking about Abraham here, but it's an example of what this is. It says, what does Scripture say? That's always a good question. 
Uh, Abraham believed God and it was credited or imputed to him as righteousness. However, to the one who doesn't work but trusts God, who, is the ju who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. My ledger looks like Jesus Christ. Does yours? That is what we have to ask. Have I believed in the only way to get from over here as a sinful man to a holy God? I have to go and accept what God has offered to me. He's put the bridge over the Grand Canyon. And that bridge is Jesus Christ. I am the way, the only way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Does that give you any kind of assurance? <sighs> do we need assurance in this world? Well, we need courage. We do. Christ in us. We, we, need, we need assurance that what God has transacted is final and we are going to live it out. We're going to demonstrate in our lives what it's like. But to be able to face the troubles of this world. Number three, the gift of inheritance. The gift of inheritance. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 17 it says, Now if, huh, what are we changing that to? Since. Now since we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, and get this, co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, or since indeed we do, in order that we may also share in his glory. In 2 Timothy 2.12 it says, Here is a trustworthy saying, If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. There is an inheritance in knowing Jesus Christ as our Savior. Letter A is that we are co-heirs with Jesus Christ. Now it's one thing to be an heir, not of my estate, but, you know, Bill Gates or somebody like that. You know, <laughs> but there's an, to be an heir is one thing, but to be a co-heir means that everything that is promised to the other one is yours as well. We are co-heirs with who? Where is that found? Did you just make that up? No, the Bible tells us that we're co-heirs with Christ, right? Do we trust the Bible? Is it our firm foundation? I hope so. So if it's there, if it's in the Bible, is it true? Okay, so I have been promised as a believer in Jesus Christ an inheritance that is the same as Jesus himself. Wow! Wow! And letter B, it cannot be lost, or will it be de depreciated in any way? I love this in First Peter. I wish we had more time to expose the whole passage, but verse 3, it says, praise God. He says, in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And listen to this and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance that we're talking about is kept in heaven for you. Who, who would be keeping it? It would be God, right? Can anybody take it away from God? No. So he's keeping it. For who? For you. For me. For believers who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. And here's 2,000 years ago, and they're talking about Jesus coming soon. It says we are to look forward to it in the New Living Translation. Uh, it says, uh, live with great expectation. This is a priceless inheritance. 
It's pure and undefiled and beyond the reach of change or decay. Whatever is laid up for us, I go to prepare a place for you and I will come again to get you so that you can come and be with me forever. It's an inheritance. When Jesus hung on that cross, he died. They laid him in a tomb. And on that third day, he rose from the grave. And he is the first fruit of all who will be raised in Jesus Christ. He came forth in a body. And so will we. He has given us this inheritance. And in this world, it's hope, isn't it? This isn't it. I mean, we look at some of the things that we wish we might have had or could have, but we look ahead and we have a hope of an inheritance that is beyond the imagination, beyond anything that we could hope for or expect. And it helps us face every single day. And number four, it all leads us to the gift of joy. You notice I didn't say happiness. God never promises us happiness. But he does promise us joy. In the good times and in the hard times. God is constantly telling us that we can have joy if we'll keep our eyes on him. In Jude chapter 20, or, uh, Jude chapter 24. <laughs> Jude, it only has one chapter. So in verse 24 of the only chapter, it says, To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault or a single fault and with great joy to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs> this is often used at funerals to, you know, talk about the person and, and give us hope about that. But can you imagine what, what this is talking about? It, it is Jesus Christ who died on that cross, rose from the grave, and he is going to present you to his father. How? I don't know how he made it. No? Here's Dave. <laughs> Barely. No, how's he going to do it? With great joy. Do you remember when you were having babies and, and all of that? And, and you, you show that child off? You can't hardly wipe the smile off your face. You know, with this, this cute little baby and everybody else is smiling. I, I, I have this idea that when when Jesus presents us to the Father he does it with great joy look look at what has happened this, this person has been redeemed by the grace of God through the blood and and here he stands our joy in God is greater than Adam's before the fall and you know why because we see all of the God's grace against that backdrop of sin Adam enjoyed God. He really did. But we will enjoy God even more because we see his grace against this dark background of sin. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 through 9, it says, In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had, may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and listen to this and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. We are exulting in what God has promised to us. The salvation of our souls. We haven't seen the end of it yet. But we can rejoice in it even now. And Paul ends chapter 8 of Romans with this, who shall separate us from the love of God? And he goes on to name everything he can think of in the universe. 
And it comes down to nothing. No one can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. Many of you have heard the story of John Newton, who was a slave trader at one time. God got a hold of his life and redeemed him. And he became a, a songwriter, a pastor, evangelist. And he always said about himself that he was forgiven much. And so he loved at much. And he preached much. He was always a great preacher of grace because he was lost. He was blind. But now he's found and he can see. It is by that abounding grace, that abundant grace, he had come to his knees before the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing grace? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we have looked at these graces that you have given us as gifts, the abundant grace that is there, we thank you that you have given us the courage of knowing that Christ is in us, and the hope of our inheritance. We thank you for the hope. We thank you for the joy. And now with John Newton, we sing to you, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind. But now I see. Stand with us, please. to sing only a sinner and it's a song we probably don't sing often but um, it's one that I sing this and I think of um, J. Vernon McGee he said there's two kinds of sinners there's saved sinners and unsaved sinners <laughs> and how true this song talks about only a sinner saved by grace Not have I gotten, but what I received. 
received, grace that bestowed it since I have believed, boasting excluded, pride I abase, I'm only a sinner, saved by grace, only a sinner, saved by grace, only a sinner. Footsteps from God to depart. Jesus have found me happy. My case, I now am a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. This is my story. Saved by grace, tears unavailing, no merit I had. Mercy has saved me, or else I must die. Sin had alarmed me, fearing God's face. But now I am sinner, saved by grace, only a sinner. Giveth more grace.
may be seated. Stop for a word of prayer, so please uh, join me in, uh, in extolling our God. We come here, we come here to praise Almighty God. To you, God, we say all your creation shows your power, your love, your ingenuity. You knew from before you created the universe that we could not be perfect as you are. So you included in your plan to save those who would respond to your love toward us and accept your paying the penalty for our sin so that we could be made right with you and perfected by the action of the Holy Spirit that you placed within us. And speaking of ingenuity, on Mother's Day we recognize your beautiful plan. You designed mankind to pair up and have a relationship with another that you designed to complete. You built into your plan the pleasure that we could experience as we learned to explore the difference between us, both physically and emotionally. You made us different in many ways so that we could find another who could complement us, each complementing the other. Nurturing and challenging, caring and dis disciplining, teaching and leading. You made us all different in many ways and when we follow your leading and choose our spouse carefully and wisely, our life can be so greatly enhanced. What a beautiful plan. Your wisdom and your ingenuity and your love for us are all shown in your plan and we thank you and praise you for it. And speaking of marriage, we have now a new baby in our uh, group. And so we thank you for um, the uh, birth of Olivia. And uh, as we go into our um, request, uh, request to you, we ask that you would be caring for Jackie and Olivia and uh, ensuring that they are responding uh, well and uh, healing from uh, that um, difficult birth. We thank you for um, the people that uh, were helping and uh, the ability for Kyle and uh, his family to um, jump in and help so that it uh, went well. We thank you for the doctors that uh, work there and so uh, they are uh, home and doing well and uh, recuperating and we ask you to continue your care over them. And we have so many others that we have on our list that we are praying for regularly that um, are dealing with the difficulties of health and life and um, so many things that um, we place before you and ask for your glory that you would be working in each of our uh, prayer requests that you would be showing your power and showing your love for us and letting that be a witness so that others are drawn to you. We thank you for the fact that you call us to put our fears and difficulties in your hands and ask for your assistance and uh, encourage us to trust us that you will work them out uh, in the way that you know is best. We ask all these things because you are the Almighty God and we put our trust in you. Praise God and always and we ask these things in Christ's name because you have shown through him that you love us. Amen. The song I'm about to sing is called Cherish the Moment and I'd like to dedicate it to all the mothers. Happy Mother's Day. Read my book, rub my back, Mommy, listen to my prayer. 
let me sit in your lap daddy fly me through the air throw a ball make a snack can we go to the park tuck me in hold me close i'm afraid Beautiful music. You also are enjoying a beautiful picture up there of a uh, roadie, and uh, that picture was taken by Jim O'Lilla here on our property. Uh, he had to look hard to find a fully blooming uh, roadie, but we've got more coming. And uh, he will take your picture today. Also, he brought his camera gear in, and uh, I know there's some families that have already made arrangements. But if you want to have a picture taken, uh, he will uh, do that. So Jim is sitting in the back by me, but uh, say hi to him and uh, let him know if he, you would like him to do that today. Oh, and by the way, it's free. Okay, and uh, the next picture up there, that's uh, our beautiful dogwood tree, which is in full bloom for moms. And it was well-timed last year, this, this time of year. It wasn't ready yet, but we thought that would be a nice thing to show you as well. Uh, next Sunday, we have actually had to take three slides for our coming events this time. So. Uh, Next Sunday, we have bread and cup communion during the service. 
And uh, after the service, we have the business meeting. We'll, we'll try and make it as efficient as we can because we know some of you will be hungry. But we have a little few minute break between the two so you can uh, get ready for, for the meeting. Okay, and uh, coming up in June, uh, we have uh, a few things. Most, most uh, uh, immediate would be men's breakfast coming up the first Saturday. And then the following Saturday is a work day at Camp Clear Lake, our camp up at uh, White Pass area. So uh, James Miller will be sharing more information about that as we get a little closer to it, but it's a great chance to uh, help get that facility ready for the summer. And uh, it's had a, a couple of bumpy summers with uh, forest fires in some years and with COVID in other years. So uh, there's probably a few things that need a little bit of work. All righty. And then, then coming up, uh, Father's Day as well. So, uh, and then a little further, here we go, perfect. A uh, little, little further down the road, we have two big things, just to put a post-it note on your calendar or put it in your computer, phone, whatever. But uh, we have uh, Sandwich Sunday, a, a long time institution, but it took a little breather here where we get together for fellowship and food after the service. That'll be uh, starting back up in July. And then in August, uh, we shift gears just a little bit and we have Sandwich Sunday on Saturday and it's a barbecue here in the afternoon and we invite folks from the neighborhood to come to us or come visit with us and, and have uh, hamburgers, et cetera, that we cook. So just two things to make note of. It's, it's a little ways down the road, but they're both worth uh, coming to and preparing for. Okay. There we go. Uh, it's not an acrostic, but uh, James already told you what GRAC is a, is a uh, acrostic for, so that's something you can uh, file away. But the notes from today, if you uh, have them in your bulletin, and what a great bulletin, all kinds of goodies in there for Mother's Day. But uh, you can fill them in, and the answers will be on the screen after the service. Okay, well, one more thing for Mother's Day. I'm going to sit down for just a second here, and we're going to watch a little mini movie about mothers. Motherhood plays an important role in the Bible. It binds the beginning and the end. These stories offer us a glimpse into the heart of God, and so we start at the beginning. Taken from the side of Adam, gifted with bringing forth life, the first woman was named Eve because she was the mother of all living. But she was also a mother in her own right, the first of many mothers to come. Though Sarah's womb was closed, God promised nations and kings would come from her. Ten years pass and motherhood seems as impossible as the day it was promised. But the Lord is faithful to keep his promises and Sarah bore a son who made her laugh. Leah was the firstborn, overlooked by her husband Jacob, who gave his heart to her younger sister. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb. Despite Jacob's disdain, she found her motherhood in the Lord. When Pharaoh became angry at the fruitfulness of the Hebrews, Jochebed sacrificed her motherhood for the sake of her son. When Pharaoh's daughter saw the child, she had compassion on him. Because of Jochebed's sacrificial motherhood, the Israelites found freedom. Naomi was a mother who experienced the loss of her sons, yet she gained a daughter in Ruth who declared, For where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. Naomi and Ruth became family by faith. Mary, a virgin and not yet married, was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. The motherhood of this blessed woman was more than the continuation of a family name, but a means for God to bring a savior into the world to save his people from their sins. From the garden to the cross, there have always been mothers. These women paved the way for all women, representing the full spectrum of the ways one could be called mom. Whether a mother in faith, mentorship, adoption, or by birth, you play an important role in the stories of generations to come. To all the Sarahs, Leahs, 
Jokabeds, and Naomi's. Happy Mother's Day. You'd think I could remember when I'm holding a rock. <laughs> but somehow I just didn't quite remember that I had this in my hand. But uh, one more thing for moms, and that is uh, uh, Sandy made another batch of, of these uh, rocks, and they have nice Bible verses, and uh, uh, they're on the table in the front. So if you want to take one home, uh, while supplies last today, of course, but take one home, or if you've got a mom or a daughter who's a mom that you want to take one home for, uh, please uh, feel free. Okay, well, Mark, Mark is away today, so I'm privileged to talk about the one-year Bible. And uh, uh, we've been in Judges, and in fact, we're still in the time of the Judges when we're reading in the Old Testament. And, you know, that's the part where it says they didn't have a king, so they did what they thought was best, and it wasn't best very often. But uh, uh, we, we, we're still in that period, but now we've gone through hearing about Ruth and Naomi, and that was kind of uplifting. And uh, now we are uh, looking at Samuel. And uh, Samuel, you know, that's another one of God's stories about somebody who couldn't have kids. And what did mom do? She, she says, if you ever let me have a kid, we're going to dedicate him to you. And that's what they did. What a great story Samuel is. But there's such a, such a contrast. Uh, Eli, you know, the, the head priest at that time period, had two rascals of sons. You know, they were Levites, and they're supposed to be doing good things, but they're like the exact opposite. And then there's this little guy, and God warns, warns them through Eli, don't be doing what you're doing, but this little guy listens to the voice of God, and you get to hear him say, what is it you want? <laughs> and uh, great chapter here. And uh, God teaches them a lesson, says, you know, I, I've told you what I'm going to do when I make a promise, it happens. And uh, Israel suffers, the ark gets taken away, and that, that's kind of today's story in the Old Testament, but there's great things coming later on in the week with, when you do the reading. Uh, the Philistines have a great victory over the Israelites, and they take away the ark and they put it in their temple next to the god Dagon. And every morning when they come into their temple, the god's fallen off the wall, and they have to put their god back on the wall. And sometimes... A hand breaks off, sometimes another hand breaks off, and sometimes the head breaks off, but that's their God. But God teaches them a lesson at the same time he's even merciful to them because he could have just wiped them all out then, but he didn't. He had a plan. In the New Testament, uh, we've got, a uh, again, a contrast of here's what the priests are supposed to do, but what are they really doing? And, you know, they're, they've got all the trappings of religion, but uh, they're not paying any attention to Jesus, who is right there in front of them. And here's what uh, Jesus says. This is in now today. So if you haven't read today, you can race home and uh, read this. Uh, in John, very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from life to death. Very truly I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Just like little Samuel listening to the voice of God and guess what happens. And then he goes on a couple, couple verses, or a couple yeah, verses later. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live. And those who have done what is evil will rise to the condemned. Or be condemned. So, again, Pastor Dave was talking about what's coming sometime, and that's what's coming. But uh, listen to him, and it'll all be fine. So, let's... Uh, oh, and there are just a few other things, like Jesus feeds 10,000 people with a sack lunch and uh, has... Leftovers, baskets and baskets of leftovers. So lots of good things to read this week in the Bible. Okay. Our, our, uh, what are you guys? You, you, you are, I was going to say you were Oscars, but that didn't quite work. <laughs> our ushers are ready for action, and uh, they are uh, going to receive the gifts that you've planned to return to the Lord this, this day. 
So let's go, let's go to him in prayer. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the many blessings you give us. Thank you today, especially for the, for the gift of mothers and the gift of children to those mothers. We just ask that you would bless families, that they would uh, remember them today, and that uh, you would be glorified through what you create in families and mothers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This has been a great service today. I've enjoyed it and been blessed. And um, the gospel message was so clearly said this morning. And uh, so, you know, whenever we have uh, the response, gets a responsibility, then we're accountable for what we've heard. And uh, so whether you're here today or or listening or online or whatever it is, or maybe it will be future even online, but there's a responsibility to answer the question. Have I received Christ? Have I, all that uh, Pastor Dave went through today that talked about the fact, first you recognize I'm a sinner. The songs revealed that, the message revealed that. Who am I? And then what do I do? What, what, what am I supposed to do at that point? And that is to run to, to Jesus Christ who died for us, who has the answers for us. And uh, as I was thinking about some songs, I was thinking this one that we're going to sing for closing. And it's Calvary Covers It All. What a great closing song. And, um, you know, if you listen to Amazing Grace, that first verse that said John Newton, he was, he was emphatic in saying that, you know, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a soul, a good person, a... Uh, no, he used the word wretch because before you can recognize that you need Jesus Christ, you have to recognize where you, who you are, a sinner, a wretched one. John Newton knew that very well. John Piper said this, he said, uh, wrote this, he said, the fact that Christ died for us is never given in scripture as a proof of our value as wonderful people. <laughs> You ever notice that? He continues, rather it is a demonstration of his unfathomable and unearned love. So unfathomable that he would die for rotten people. Wretches like you and me to free us from our sin. You see, yes to that. And then a German theologian, you've probably heard of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He said, grace is free, but it is not cheap. It cost Jesus Christ his life, his blood. Let's stand and sing, Calvary covers it all. Far dearer than all that the world can impart was the mess.
message that came to my heart. How that Jesus alone for my sin did atone, and Calvary covers it all. Calvary that song kind of wraps it up it says it all and uh, if you have a question about salvation about who Jesus is about what you've heard here today talk to the pastor he'll be at the back or talk to someone else here and uh, talk to me talk to John whoever but talk to uh, one of us don't let it go to the past today is the day of salvation have a great week